Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We're, uh, we're making headway now. We're in chapter 3, and we're only going to go through the first four chapters of John and answer the question, who is Jesus? And then after that, we're going to have Easter. Easter is going to be the, is it the third Sunday? The third Sunday of April. And then we'll take um, a two-week series for our stewardship campaign. And then we're going to do a three-week series on parenting. And then we're going to spend some time in Psalms. And then we'll come back to John in July. So John chapter 3. In this passage, Jesus has a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is a really important guy. He, He is a member of a party called the Pharisees. He's also a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and he's a teacher. So he's a well, very well-respected man. And he comes to Jesus and he asks a question or he starts to ask a question and Jesus really answers before he can even ask one as if he knows what he wants. Um, Or maybe Jesus tries to unsettle him. And so this man is really, really important and he comes to Jesus Um, And he comes to Jesus in a very respectful way with a very uh, respectful tone. And yet, he doesn't have any idea who Jesus really is. And he's not prepared to say, as others will later, and John the Baptist has said already, that Jesus is the Messiah. So he stops short of realizing who Jesus is, but he does show a great deal of respect. And all of a sudden, when he's showing this respect, Jesus just cuts him off and, and, and basically kind of removes the rug from under his feet and challenges everything he believes. So if you, if you would, stand with me in honor of God's word, if you're willing and able, as we go through the first 21 verses. Now, some Bibles will have read for Jesus' words. That, that was added as a feature later, a marketing feature, honestly. And then some ended at verse 15, and some go through verse 21. And and I'll just tell you that most scholars are convinced that Jesus' words probably end around verse 15. And then John is speaking in the verses 16 and following. Now, it's all Scripture. That's why I don't like the red. It's all equally God's Word. But it appears that John is going to elaborate on what Jesus says in the last few sentences. So, chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of of God. How can... A person be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Unless a person is born of water and the spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind which, by the way, is the same word for spirit. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not Accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. 
because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what he has done has been done through God. Let's pray. Father, help us to grasp the message behind Jesus' words to Nicodemus so that we can live the life that you hold out for us eternal life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There's a lot going on in this passage, and we don't have time to cover all the details, but we do want to hit the high notes, the important stuff. We want to hit the big stuff. And I I want to give you one of the biggest ideas right off the bat And from what Jesus is telling Nicodemus, it is clear that none of us can meet God's standards unless we're reborn. And this came as a shock to Nicodemus because he was a Pharisee. And and Pharisees were the largest party in those days, um, made up of um, devout Jewish men all across Israel. They lived all over the place. Uh, They weren't part of the temple party. That was the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the rich compromisers who compromised with Rome for the sake of power. Pharisees did not believe in compromise. The Sadducees only accepted the first five books of Scripture. The Pharisees, on the other hand, accepted the entire Old Testament of Scripture. In addition to accepting the Old Testament of Scripture, the Pharisees also believed and accepted as just as valid the oral tradition passed down for hundreds of years by rabbis, their commentary and interpretation on the Old Testament. They were the uber conservatives of their day, and every Jewish mom wanted her little boys to grow up to be Pharisees. We don't think of it that way because Jesus came into conflict with them so often, but the Pharisees were the good guys. They were the ones who actually paid attention to Scripture. They're the ones who memorized Scripture. They're the ones who went to Bible studies. They're the ones who led Bible studies. They were the teachers. They were the preachers. They were the ones everybody respected, and though many of them came into significant conflict with Jesus, a few of them did not, one of whom was Nicodemus. And as someone who paid attention to scriptures, he he recognized when he saw the miracles Jesus performed that it was impossible for him to do some of those things unless God were somehow anointing him. And so he comes to Jesus, and he's this teacher, preacher, uh, Ph.D., Uh, professor at a religious university. I mean, he's like somebody important. And he comes to Jesus in a respectful tone and Jesus isn't impressed. And Jesus says, you have to be reborn. He said, born again, which could also be translated born a second time. John probably is thinking of both terms. And, And this religious leader is like, you must be kidding me. Like start over, start over. Do you know what I've achieved? Jesus says, I don't care what you've achieved. It means nothing. It means nothing. You know what he wants? He wants Jesus to come to him and say, there's only one thing you lack. Do this one thing and you're fine. Or he wants Jesus to say, you know what? You're already there. You just keep going. You're already there. He wants Jesus to give him maybe one or two hard things at the most. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, you have to start over. Start over. But I've come so far. <laughs> and Jesus doesn't say this to anyone else, right? It, I asked you the question. It was sort of unfair. How would you share with someone um, how they can be accepted by God? It's a little unfair because most likely you would tailor what you say for the person you're talking to. Because Jesus never shared the good news with two people the same way. And though born again has become popular in our vocabulary, Jesus only used that expression one time with one guy. Because it's what he needed to hear. But it's an important message for all of us. Listen to how clear Jesus was about this. Jesus says no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again, born from above, born a second time. No one can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. And then he used another phrase later. He said no one can enter. Enter and see are probably synonyms. No one can enter. No one can see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, unless they're born of water and spirit. 
And it can be the spirit, but literally it's water and spirit. And it's not born of water and born of spirit like it's two separate things. There's, there's, no, um, there's no preposition or um, definite article in front of them. So it's probably water and spirit together is one thing. We'll explain that in a moment. And then he, he says it a third time. He says, you shouldn't be surprised that, that I said you must, you must be born again. Jesus said this three times in a very short span of time so that Nicodemus wouldn't miss it. You have to be reborn. You're going to have to start over. It's the last thing Nicodemus wants to hear. He's achieved everything. He's like the Eagle Scout of Jews, right? And Jesus says you have to start over as if you know nothing. And the second one, born of water and spirit, is confusing, but I want to explain it in light of the Old Testament because Jesus, as he, as he continues talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus gets really worked up. How can someone do that? How can, how can you say that? How can that be done? He's just, he's, he's bothered by what Jesus is saying. He pushes back really hard. And Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher, and you don't understand what I'm saying? Like, you teach this stuff, and you're confused? He may be referring to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Now, I don't have it up here because it's a long passage. You can turn there if you want. But he might be referring to a passage from Ezekiel 36 when he says water and spirit. I don't know for sure, but it's a guess. It's one that makes sense to me. When I go to Ezekiel 36, I'll read this passage for you. Jesus might have been referring to this. Ezekiel writes, and this is quoting God. God says, for I will take you out of the nations... I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you. There's the water. And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Cleansing and forgiveness is clearly what water means. Verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Here's spirit. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll take out your hard heart, God says, and give you a soft heart. And I will put my spirit, their spirit again, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I will give you a heart transplant and then give you my spirit, God says. And then verse 28, you will live in the land I gave your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. In this passage, we have water and spirit together, the cleansing of forgiveness and then the renewal from the inside. We're forgiven of our sins and we're made new with a heart transplant. Jesus says, how does this confuse you? It's already in the scriptures that you teach that you have to be reborn. The metaphor in Ezekiel is a heart transplant. Nicodemus, I don't care how long you've been a teacher, how many years of school you've been in, how many Bible studies you've taught, how many hours you've been reading and memorizing Scripture, you have to start anew. God has to change you from the inside. You have to become Nicodemus 2.0. Some people call this conversionism. I was talking to a pastor this week. And we were talking about a fellow friend of ours who's another pastor. and He's part of a different tribe from us. And, and he's a very formal liturgical tribe. And my friend said, when I met him, I was so surprised to found out he was a conversionist. Because how many, and he mentioned that tribe, how many of that tribe are conversionists? And I was, I was confused for a second. Then I realized he was talking about John chapter 3. And that this, this friend of ours who's a pastor of a church in a, in a very formal traditional church uh, believes that you have to start over. You have to be born again. And I thought to myself, well, of course he believes that because it's in the Bible and he's our friend and he believes the Bible. Are there people in that tribe who don't believe the Bible? It's, it's here, right? And this is a big deal in the 70s. How many of you lived through the 70s? Some of you lived through the 70s. So in the 70s, this was a big deal. It was the born again decade. Do you guys remember that? And um, the word born again showed up on the front uh, page of, may, uh, of, of newspapers and, and it was on the, the front of several magazines. It was the born again decade and um, Billy Graham was uh, preaching, you must be born again. Ch- uh, Chuck Colson, who had at one time been uh, Nixon's hatchet man, went to prison, uh, became a Christian as he was going to prison, and wrote a book, his biography, which was simply called Born Again. 
And then when Jimmy Carter was elected president in 1976, he was called, you know, the first born-again president. It was just the born-again decade, and we keep talking about born-again, born-again, born-again all the time, and we haven't been talking about it much since. But the reality is, it is in the Bible, it is true, and Jesus said, you must be born a second time. And this is really hard for us to grasp because in our mind, the whole point of life is to, is to improve. And Jesus says, God is not about improving you. God is about changing you into a new person. Christianity is not about reformation. It's not about getting better. It's not about self-improvement. Christianity is about starting over for the first time all over again. It's about being made new. Let me, let me help tell you a story to help you understand this. Uh, years ago, when I was uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, I, uh, I got an opportunity to hear um, a, a doctor speak to uh, the Christian organization I was a part of in college. He came and spoke to our group. And this guy was a, a medical doctor, a general practitioner, a lay person. Um, he had never been a pastor, never been to seminary. He's a full-time general practitioner. And he came and spoke to our group um, because he was a missionary in his heart. And he loved this guy. His name was uh, Herbert Walker. He loved uh, sharing the gospel with his patients. That was his favorite thing to do. And because he has a private practice, he can do whatever he wants, right? So he said to our group, he said, I have three different colored folders. I don't remember the colors, but he said, I have three different colors of folders. So when I pick up the folder and look at their file, I'll automatically know something about them. Because I have a certain color folder if I've had a conversation with them about spiritual things and I know that they love Jesus. I have another color folder if I had a conversation with them and I know they don't know Jesus. I have another color folder for people I haven't yet had a conversation with, and I'm not sure where they stand with Jesus. So the moment I pick up their file, I look at the color folder I'm holding, and I know something. And I use that as I meet with them. He says, my absolute favorite thing to do is to lead really old people to Jesus. He says, you don't know how much fun this is, but I, I get elderly men and women sitting across from me, and I'll have a conversation with them about spiritual things. And I, he said, just recently, I had a little old lady that was sitting across from me, and I asked her um, if she was a Christian. And she said something that a lot of us say that is dead wrong, okay? And we say it. A lot of us say it. And I'm not beating you up, but it's wrong. We say, I've always been a Christian. Well, no, you have to start over. Even if you're Nicodemus, you got to start over. No one has always been a Christian. So he says to her, you've always been a Christian. Well, was there ever a time in your life, this is what Dr. Walker asked, is, has there ever been a time in your life where you realized that because of the way you've rebelled against God, you deserve to go to hell? And she goes, heavens, no, Dr. Walker. I've never, ever deserved to go to hell. And then he says, then it's not possible for you to be a Christian because a Christian realizes they deserve to go to hell. And apart from God's grace, that's exactly where they'll spend eternity. The truth is, we all have it coming. We all deserve it, but Jesus came into this world and died for us so that we could be made new, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be changed. Would you be willing to ask Jesus to do that now? And he leads these religious people who've been going to church their whole lives. He leads them to Christ because they've grown up religious for 70 years, but never, ever realized the gospel, that none of us are right with God, none of us, until Jesus forgives us and makes us new. So the question is, what does that look like? What does it look like to be born a second time? Before we get into that, we're going to take a brief intermission, then we'll come back and cover that. Um, we're going to take a, a three-minute intermission. You can go out these doors to the restroom. There are drinks back here. We'll be back in three minutes. All right, if you would find your way back to your tables. So no one, no one can possibly meet God's standards, us included, unless they are reborn. That's the message Jesus gave to someone who seemed to have his act together more than anyone in this room. The question is, how is a person reborn? And Jesus answered that question as well in this passage. And you could write this down. We're reborn only, only when we trust in the crucified Jesus. Now, that was a little bit more than Nicodemus could really comprehend at this stage because Jesus had not yet died, but he hinted that he would. 
Which is mind-blowing when you think this might have been three or more years before Jesus was put to death. We're only reborn when we trust in the crucified Jesus. The word trust is important here. Uh, John's favorite word uh, in Greek is often translated believe in, uh, in the New Testament in English. And you'll find it here like in John 3.16, John 3.15. The word believe. The problem with the word believe, I don't like that word, is in English the word believe can mean just accept something to be mentally true. And that's not what Jesus means. It's not what John means. Because the devil knows what's true. The word really is trust. We're reborn only when we trust in the crucified Jesus. And Jesus shared that with Nicodemus in a way Nicodemus could not grasp at this point. Jesus referred to an Old Testament story. A story that Nicodemus knew. But he had no idea what Jesus meant. He said, and you can look at this. Go back to verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Well, there you go. Class over. Lesson learned. And Nicodemus, knowing the story, would have walked away, scratching his head, going, what? Let's go back to that story. That story, again, I'm not going to put it up here. It's too long, but you can look it up if you want to. It's uh, Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. It's a really short story. I mean, it's five verses. That's all that's given to it. Five verses, bam, over. But five really rich stories about an event that happened once when the people of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. Verse 4, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Well, whatever's going to happen next, I can tell you this, it ain't good. Verse 6, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. Well, that'll show them. (laughs) They bit the people, and many Israelites died. Well, this is a pure tragedy. Verse 7, the people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. People often say, you know, most people only confess when it costs them something. Right, because we're normal, okay? That's what people do. God gets our attention with what? Pain. pain. And you're like, oh, I've made a mistake. Yeah, after you get pain, you, you realize it. We all do. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and, and against you. Pray the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people because he's a good shepherd. He's a good leader. He prayed for them. I mean, they deserve to get bit. But people are dying. Moses has a heart. He prayed for them. Verse 8, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake. This is such odd instructions. Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Moses is like taking notes. Uh Uh-huh, okay. Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Okay. Verse 9, so Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Boy, that's weird. That's such a strange story, isn't it? It was so strange that people eventually came to see it as a magic snake. And during the time of Hezekiah, hundreds of years later, he had to smash it to bits. Because people worshipped the bronze snake. They missed the point. God could have used anything. He could have told him to do anything. Like, it was random. God's instructions are totally random. Except they're not. Because it was always a metaphor for the gospel. And the people would only understand it when Jesus died. The story was a snake up on a pole. And the people looked at it and no doubt believed. 
The word faith is never used, but they didn't just look at it. They looked at it believing that somehow looking at the snake's going to help me, and then it helped them. And they're like, I'll be dog. So they had faith. They trusted. They trusted in the bronze snake that God told Moses to make. It was ultimately God who rescued them. These were God's instructions, but it was a metaphor that would only really make sense later when Jesus said to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the bronze snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that all who believe in him may have eternal life. It was never about a snake. It was about God's provision. And God's ultimate provision wasn't a snake. That only helped a few people at one time. It was a picture that one day the Son of Man would be lifted up in much the same way, only he will be put to death. The word lifted up, interestingly, can mean physically lift something up. It can also mean to glorify. And John clearly means the phrase both ways. Because in John's gospel, Jesus doesn't die and then later is glorified by the resurrection or ascension. According to John, it's in the crucifixion that Jesus is glorified. We realize the Father's love for us when we look at the cross. We realize the love of Jesus, the love of the Father, and the power of God when we look to the cross. We see the humility of the Savior and the power of redemption when we look to the cross. The cross is not just the death of Jesus. It's his glory in a world that looked at his death and thought that was his shame. The Jewish people in the day of Jesus thought his death was his shame. But Jesus knew it was his finest hour. And he said... When the Son of Man is lifted up, those who look and believe will have eternal life. Somehow that makes no sense to me. When we trust in what God did through Jesus and his death, we are forgiven and made new. We're set free. And Nicodemus lived long enough to see Jesus die and rise from the dead. And no doubt, Jesus' words finally made sense. And I hope Nicodemus believed. I hope he believed. Um, He definitely had courage later, it's very clear. He had courage later. But in these early days, he seems to be a secret believer. He comes to Jesus at night. He doesn't want his friends to catch him talking to Jesus. But he believes Jesus has words from God. Jesus is worth listening to, but he comes in darkness, and that metaphor is so powerful because of what John writes later in this passage about light and darkness. And I think that's also important. There's one last thing I want to share with you this morning, and that is if you want to experience the forgiveness that comes through the cross, you and I must be brave enough to let God's light expose the truth in us. This is the hard thing we do. I think trusting is easy, but to really trust, we have to believe, like Dr. Walker told his patients, that it's worse than we think. We have to be willing to stand before God and say, God, shine your light of truth on me and expose every dark corner in me so that I can give it to you, so that I I can remove it. I want to be the person you made me to be. Take every deceitful, evil, wicked thought, every hunger and desire and thing in me that doesn't honor you and expose it to me and to you so that together we can live in the light. I can live in the light with your help, with your power. And that sounds easy to do, but that's really hard. Guys, that is really hard to do. And it's not hard to do in the sense that it takes a ton of work. It's hard to do because we don't want to do it. We're like cockroaches, right? You turn the light on and, you know, they just run to the refrigerator or someplace and they just go and hide. And we're like that. We don't like the light because John says it here, our our deeds are evil. We don't want to be exposed. We know the truth about what we've done and what we've thought in secret. We don't want the world to know. God says, let my light shine on you and expose everything good and evil in you so that I can remake you. And we want there to be another way, a plan B. 
And I used to think this was just for this light was just for those of us who come to Christ, and we never have to throw ourselves under this light again. But what I have learned is we have to constantly throw ourselves under the light of Jesus and let him expose what is in us, reveal it, bring it to the surface so that we can all see it and deal with it. Guys, this is really hard to do. Um, it was hard for me last year. You know, last year, for those of you who don't know, um, in July of last year, I... Uh, inappropriately, illegitimately, wrongly fired our assistant pastor at the time, uh, Dustin DeYoung. And later I, I tried to undo that and ask him to come back. And it was just a really big, ugly event. Um, I, uh, a, a, as it became clear what I had done, I had to apologize because in my heart I had to. I just had to. I asked Dustin and his wife and their kids to forgive me. I asked the leaders. I asked the congregation. Um, and, and, of course, I did that in stages because I didn't fully realize all that I had done and why I had done it to begin with. So um, I spent a lot of time really thinking about that. In the month of August, I was on probation, which next year, Hope and I will celebrate 25 years here. And after being here 24 years, I was put on probation for a month. Church discipline, that's horrible. That's tough. That's Talk about shame. And so for five Sundays, I couldn't even get up here. Our first five Sundays in Empire, I couldn't even stand up here. And I had to walk into Counseling with Hope. And work through that stuff. And, and the worst Sunday I've ever had in 25 years here was July 25th, 2021. And I will never forget that if I live to be 102. And I, I stood up our last Sunday at, at Desert Sky. stood up in front of everyone and just at, shared what I had done and asked the church to forgive me. And, and got feedback from people and let people speak into me. And uh, it was really, really awkward and painful and shameful. And all the things we fear when we do that is, is shame and rejection. And I got all of those in spades. I mean, I did get rejection. Some of it was temporary, and, and, and ultimately I was forgiven. Some people have rejected me as a pastor and leader permanently or indefinitely and, and still haven't forgiven me. And so it was really hard because I had to walk into a lot of shame and a lot of rejection and a lot of fear. And I just wanted to die. But I trusted in my heart that God is good. And that if I let his light shine upon me and expose every evil way in me, that God would work it together for his good and my good, for his glory and my best interest. I had to believe that. Or I would have slipped out the back. Ultimately, the question is this. Do we have enough courage to believe that when God shines his light on us, we will not be destroyed? But that our best days are ahead of us if and only if we allow God's floodlights. Does it hurt? Well, does laser surgery hurt? <laughs> I imagine it burns, but it brings healing. If you want a heart transformation, if you want to be reborn, you have to be willing to go undergo the knife. But the, the God who holds it is good. And he loves you. And he is careful and precise. And he never wastes a hurt. And he will transform you over the course of your life if you let him into the person he made you to be. But you and I have to be brave enough to undergo heart surgery. Are you willing to do that? Because if you are, your best days are in front of you. Let's pray. Father, give us courage. Give us courage to submit to your power and your strength and your grace. Father, give us the courage to let you shine your light on us and to expose every wicked way in us that we might more and more become the people you made us to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.